I'm Dr. Mark Atala, and I want to welcome you to the second chapter of Schultz and Schultz's History of Modern Psychology. Today we'll be talking about the philosophical influences on psychology. And so we'll be talking about things like defecating ducks, and then philosophers like Descartes, August Comte, John Locke, Berkeley, and John Stuart Mill, and Mill's father also. But let's get started by talking about the defecating duck, which was a sensation in France in the mid 1700s. Now, Jacques du Vaucousson, pardon my high school French, built an automaton in 1739 of a duck that could, it had a lot of moving parts, but it could defecate. And everybody thought that was absolutely hilarious. He charged a week's wages just to see this duck and he got rich quack. Uh, that's quick, that's just me being silly. He also created an uh, animated flute player who could play 12 different tunes, but it's unclear whether uh, the flute player could defecate. The point is this, that intricate machines were being invented and perfected for use in science, industry, and entertainment. And this is the spirit of mechanism, that machines were becoming familiar to people at all levels of society, and this idea that maybe the universe itself is a great machine. So how would we study it? Well, the distinguishing features of science at this time are observation, experimentation, and measurement. And so the idea is to define and describe phenomena with numbers. So people invent things like ther thermometers, barometers, slide rules, and things like that. Measuring devices are perfected and they reinforce the idea that it was possible to measure every aspect of the natural universe. The clock was a technological sensation of the 17th century, uh, and they were made a model for the, for the physical universe. They're a good model because clocks are regular, predictable, and precise. And some people even said that maybe God was a watchmaker, and that's the idea of deism, which a lot of the founders of the American Republic believed in. Determinism is the belief that every act is determined or caused by past events. So we can predict the changes that will occur if we understand the order and regularity of the mechanism. Determinism is gonna play a big part in later psychology with researchers like Freud, Watson, and Skinner. A similar idea is reductionism. And this is the idea that the workings of a machine can be understood by reducing them to basic components. So you can take a clock apart and then reassemble it to see how it works. Maybe people are just complex machines. This was the other idea of the time. People might be better, more efficient and more complex machines, but machines nonetheless. Let's talk about Charles Babbage now. He was fascinated by clocks and automata as a boy and then he taught himself mathematics uh, to the point where by the time he went off to college at Cambridge, he was disappointed to discover that he understood more about math than members of the faculty. But he invented a difference engine, which uh, was a, an early computer, uh, but it was all gears and cogs and things like that. It imitated human mental actions. Uh, it could do math, it could play chess, checkers, and, thing, and other games. But the, the important idea is that it externalized mental effort through a machine that you could, you could pull a crank and turn it and it would give you answers. Now the problem was that he never finished the difference engine. Uh, the government withdrew its financial support and that was that. However, in 1991, a group of British scientists built a duplicate of the difference engine. It, it works, it weighs three tons and performs calculations flawlessly. Well, after 10 years, Babbage moved on to the analytical engine. This was programmed through punch cards and it had a memory and a CPU, a central processing unit. Ada Lovelace was the first person to explain the analytical engine's function, potential, and limitations in 1843. Lovelace was the poet Byron's daughter and she was a math prodigy. Babbage called her his enchantress of numbers, and she referred to herself as the bride of science. So it was another time. Now, to go back to the analytical engine though, it was never constructed either due to lack of funding, uh, but a project to build it was supported by the British government in, starting in 2011, 
and it's thought to take at least a decade to build, but they're gonna try to build it. It's basically a steampunk computer, and so we'll have to see how that turns out. Well, let's move on to the philosophers, and let's start with Rene Descartes. Now, he was born in 1596, and he inherited enough money to finance a life of intellectual pursuits and travel. He was attracted, this is kind of strange, but he was attracted to women who squinted, but his only romantic attachment was very short-lived. He had a child with a Dutch woman, and the child, whose name was Francine, died in his arms when uh, she was only five years old. And he was so upset that he remained celibate for the rest of his life. Now, Descartes embodies the transition to a modern era of science. And you can tell that he's modern because his picture's in color. Descartes doubted everything except what's determined by empirical methods. And that's what empiricism is, the pursuit of knowledge through observation and experimentation. Now, unfortunately, he died in Sweden of pneumonia in 1650. He was actually a tutor of, uh, to the Queen of Sweden, and the Queen was cross-eyed and squinted, which was good for a Descartes, but she also insisted on having her lessons at 5 a.m. in an unheated room uh, during winter in Stockholm, and since Descartes liked to lie in bed thinking until noon, this was not so good for her, and he died of pneumonia. He has ideas about the mind-body problem, though. Are the mental world and the material world distinct? Now, there was the idea of dualism, that the mind and body have two different natures. So before Descartes, people thought that the mind controls the body. And the analogy would be that of the relationship between a puppet and a puppeteer, where your body's like a puppet and your mind is like the puppeteer that controls it. Descartes, though, proposes that there's an interaction between mind and body, and that the body gives feedback to the mind also. Where does the interaction occur? Well, he says it's in the pineal body or pineal gland or canarium. Now, he chooses this area because it's the only brain structure that's not divided and duplicated in each hemisphere of the brain. Now, in reality, uh, the pineal gland is just a gland that produces melatonin, uh, which helps modulate sleep patterns and circadian rhythms. But for him, it was really where the mind and body come together to interact. So what is the nature of mind and what's the nature of body? This is the classic ontological question. For Descartes, the body was like a machine and he talks about uh, reflex action theory. So basically he proposes in Latin, it's called the undulatio reflexa, which is when a movement of the body is not determined by a conscious choice to move. Descartes is credited with this idea of reflex action theory, which is a precursor of the stimulus response theory in psychology. For him, the mind is non-material and lacks physical substance. And it contains two different types of ideas, derived and innate ideas. Uh, derived ideas are products of the experiences of the experiences of the senses. So what does a bell sound like? What does a tree look like? These are products of daily living. But we also have innate ideas, ideas that we're born with, products of the mind or consciousness. So God, the self, perfection, the passage of time. Now that picture is of Quetzalcoatl, which I don't think that's the God Descartes was thinking of when uh, he was referring to the innate idea of God, but still, uh, it's valid. Uh, these ideas of his, these derived and innate ideas, impact contemporary cognitive psychology in that our ability to perceive is innate rather than learned. And that's a debate that we still have. Auguste Comte uh, was brilliant but very troubled. And this is a few hundred years later now. We're in the 1800s. He never held an academic position and he struggled financially and had frequent periods of dementia. His central idea is that of positivism, and that's a system based on facts that are objectively observable. He rejects any kind of speculation, inference, or metaphysical methods. No unobservable forces or religious beliefs were allowed for Comte. Uh, he believed that the physical sciences had already reached a positivist state However, the social sciences weren't there yet. I think it's debatable whether we 
are still in uh, our current time. On his deathbed, he said that his death was an irreparable loss to the world. So he has a, uh, he has a healthy self-image, I guess we would say. Another theory that meshes well with positivism is materialism. Materialism is the idea that the universe can be described in physical terms and explained by the properties of matter and energy. So other philosophers were interested in how the brain acquires knowledge, which they thought was from experience, and that's empiricism. And in this way, positivism, materialism, and empiricism became the philosophical foundations of psychology. So let's talk about John Locke, who's primarily a political philosopher, but uh, he was concerned with how the mind acquires knowledge and his major work of importance to psychology is uh, an, essay concerning human, an essay concerning human understanding, which was published in 1620. Now Locke argues that humans are born with no knowledge whatsoever, that the mind at birth is a tabula rasa, a blank slate. And this is, in, this is congruent with the beliefs of Aristotle. He rejects Descartes' view of innate ideas. And he admits that some ideas, like the idea of God, might seem to be innate, but that's because we're taught these ideas at ch as children, and we can't remember a time when we didn't know about them. And so that, therefore, they seem innate, even though they're actually learned. He also says there's two kinds of experiences, sensations and reflections. Sensations appear first and are simple sense impressions, and reflections are produced by combining past sensory impressions, and that's a source of abstractions and higher level ideas. Now, sensations have to appear first because the mind needs a reservoir of sense impressions to reflect on to form ideas. Here's some of his proposals. So he talks about simple ideas, and these can arise from both sensation and reflection but they're elemental and can't be reduced to simpler ideas. Complex ideas, though, are new ideas made by combining simple ideas, and they're created by reflection and then can also be broken back down into simpler component ideas. This marks the beginning of the mental chemistry approach and leads to the idea of association, which is another term for learning. So definitionally, association is this idea that human ideas can be combined and reduced, disassembled and reassembled like a complex machine. Again, the clockwork universe. He also talks about primary and secondary qualities. Uh, primary qualities exist in an object even if it's not perceived, and secondary qualities exist in our perception of the object. So the size and shape of a building are primary qualities, but the building's color is a secondary quality. Or for another example, think about an apple. Its size and shape are its primary qualities or our primary qualities, but its taste is a secondary quality because it requires perception. Before we leave Locke though, I wanted to leave you with his last words, which were, I thought, interesting. He said, I've lived long enough and I thank God I've enjoyed a happy life. So that's not a bad way to go. George Berkeley was very smart, very young, and also very religious. Uh, well, he was, he was successful when he was young. Uh, he was born and educated in Ireland, but he traveled extensively, and he even spent three years in America. And when he left, he left his house and library to Yale. He was financially independent because of a gift of money that he received from a woman that he met only once at a dinner party which is proof, if any is needed, that it always pays to be nice. Now, his, his position was later labeled as mentalism to emphasize the purely mental phenomena. But it's this idea that all knowledge depends on a perceiving person. Berkeley argues that there, this disagrees with Locke. He says that there were no primary qualities, so that all knowledge depended on a person perceiving it. However, because perception is subjective, this isn't an exact mirror of the world. Well, then how are things perceived? Well, he says that God is the permanent perceiver of the universe. So do things exist without a perceiver? So if a tree falls in the forest, does it make a sound if no one's there? And he says, yes, because of God. 
Uh, God is the eternal perceiver. I mean, he is a bishop after all, so he believes in God and uses him to explain these phenomena. So if a tree falls in the forest and no one's there to hear it, God hears it. You can think of it that way. He also makes a contribution to visual perception with an essay towards a new theory of vision in 1709. Now, he ant anticipates the modern view of depth perception. He says that a continuous sensory experience and se sensations from the eye muscles link to produce the perception of death, depth, <laughs> death, of depth. And these are basically the physiological cues of accommodation and convergence. Jane, James Mill is the father of John Stuart Mill and was made to feel special and superior as a child. He was not allowed to be around other children and spent his time studying. He went to college as educated at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland and served as a clergyman in the Church of Scotland. But he quit because no one in his congregation could understand his sermons. Now, he applied the doctrine of mechanism to the human mind. His goal was to destroy the illusion of all mental activities. He wanted to show that the mind was nothing more than a machine. Now, he also believed that the mind was a passive entity, that it was acted upon by stimuli, and he didn't believe in creativity or free will because association for him was a totally automatic passive process. Now, the one thing he did believe in was mentally abusing his son, John Stuart Mill. Now, as a child, John Stuart Mill was allowed no toys, friends, or breaks from study. He was punished when he made mistakes, but never praised for his accomplishments. What this achieved was that by age three, he could read Plato in Greek. By 12, he had mastered the standard university curriculum. And by 18, he described himself as a logic machine. Now, the problem is by age 21, he had a major breakdown and was very depressed. He felt his father was too strict and his mother showed him no love. At age 25, he fell for Mrs. Harriet Taylor. They spent a lot of time together, which upset her husband, Mr. Taylor. So they made a compromise. Harriet would be faithful to both men by not having sex with either of them. So that lasted for a while. Her husband eventually died, uh, but Mill was heartbroken when Harriet died. But at age 52, he fell for Harriet's 27-year-old daughter, Helen, and Helen remained his companion for the rest of his life. Now, Mill argues against the mechanistic position of his father. He believed that the mind plays an active role in the association idea of ideas. And he says this is a creative synthesis, that the proper combining of mental elements produces some distinct qualities not present originally. So complex ideas are more than the sum of their parts. He's influenced by research in chemistry, which is a very different model. But you can think of it this way. Chemical compounds exhibit attributes and qualities that aren't present in their component parts or elements so that hydrogen and oxygen are put together and they produce water. And water has uh, components that aren't part of either of those elements. And so that the same is true of complex ideas also, and that's mental chemistry model. Let's conclude by talking about the contributions of empiricism. With the rise of empiricism, uh, we approach problems with methods that are atomistic, uh, mechanistic, and positivistic. And we should reconsider these principles of empiricism, that the primary role of uh, the processes, process of sensation, the analysis of conscious experience into elements, the synthesis of elements into complex mental experiences through the process of association, and a focus on conscious processes. So you can see early psychology taking shape. What was needed next was an experimental approach to the subject matter. That's chapter two, and thanks for listening.